Good morning. This meeting will come to order. This is a public meeting of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I'd like to welcome members of the public and market participants, as well as those on the phone or watching our webcast. I'd also like to welcome my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Quinten, Commissioner Benham, Commissioner Stump, and Commissioner Berkovitz. As always, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll join, I'll lead, and anyone is welcome to join. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today, we will be discussing and voting on a final rule to amend Part 50 to codify certain exemptions from the clearing requirement. We'll hear a staff presentation before the Commission deliberates and votes. We'll now move to opening statements. I'll go first, followed by my fellow commissioners in order of seniority. Commissioners are free to reserve the, the, their time to make a longer closing statement if they wish. Well, the final rule that we're going to be voting on today exempts from the clearing requirement certain swaps entered into by small bank holding companies, savings and loan holding companies, and community development financial institutions. In other words, domestic entities that look very different from Wall Street banks. Finally, the rule also, or I shouldn't say finally, in addition, the rule clarifies existing exemptions for, again, very small institutions such as banks, savings associations, farm credit systems, and credit unions with total act, act, assets under $10 billion. These entities are the engines of the real economy, providing financial support to American communities, businesses, and families. While today's final rule makes sense in normal times, it's especially critical now. As we continue to manage the fallout of COVID-19, it's particularly important that we advance the CFTC's strategic goal of regulating the derivatives markets to promote the interest of all Americans. Today's final amendments of part, for Part 50 are a step in that direction. In addition, they also reflect the CFTC's commitment to international comedy and deference. So in addition to exempting those small entities that I, met, that I mentioned uh, domestically, it also exempts foreign sovereigns, foreign central banks, as well as international financial institutions such as the World Bank and IMF from the clearing requirement. And just as we would expect that a foreign regulator would not impose a clearing requirement on, for example, the U.S. Treasury or the Federal Reserve when acting on behalf of the United States of America, uh, we would accord the same deference to foreign countries as well. Speaking of international, there are two other announcements I wanted to make. The first is that the CFTC and the South African Reserve Bank have signed a statement of intent to cooperate and support fintech innovation. Specifically, Lab CFTC and the South African Reserve Bank's fintech unit will spearhead this effort. This follows similar arrangements with authorities in the UK, Singapore, and Australia in 2018, and then the CFTC's joining the Global Financial Innovation Network just last year in 2019. Coordinating with our international partners has many benefits, including helping regulators keep up with the rapid pace of technological changes in our markets. I'm excited for the opportunity to build on those efforts with our counterparts in South Africa. The second international announcement is that this afternoon, the CFTC will announce a number of ex exemptions under Part 30 of our rules. The CFTC's Part 30 exemptive program has been around for 30 years. During that time, it's provided U.S. customers with increased access to foreign futures and options markets where foreign intermediaries are subject to comparable customer protection standards. Specifically, We'll be issuing orders for the Bombay Stock Exchange and the National Stock Exchange International Financial Center, uh, both based in India. We'll also be issuing one for the Montreal Exchange, uh, based, of course, in Canada, our neighbor to the north, as well as for the New Zealand Exchange, and then finally for a series of entities based in Singapore. I've promised increased comedy and deference to our international counter counterparts, and this relief makes good on that commitment. Altogether, these two announcements, 
as well as today's rulemaking, show the CFTC is the global standard for sound derivatives regulation. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize my fellow commissioners for their opening statements, starting with Commissioner Quintens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to you. Uh, I don't have any opening statements this morning, uh, except to just um, say thank you uh, to you and to the staff for not only the final rule that we have before us today, but for all of the deferential 30.10 uh, exemptions that you mentioned. Uh, I was very pleased to vote for those. Uh, and I think any time that the CFTC recognizes foreign jurisdictions that are comparable to ours and that can allow efficient and effective and seamless uh, cross-border risk management, uh, it is a good thing for the markets and it's a good thing for international comedy. So with that, congratulations on that. I was pleased to support them. And I look forward to supporting today's rule. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Quintens. Commissioner Benham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to my fellow commissioners and staff and everyone who has a chance to listen uh, to this morning's meeting. Look forward to the discussion and the presentation by the Division of Clearing and Risk. I also don't have any formal opening remarks, but I certainly look forward to the um, discussion and, and the question and answer period and look forward to um, the vote uh, later on this morning. Certainly look, uh, appreciate uh, bringing these rules up. Um, I think, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, a good um, indication of our uh, ability uh, as an agency to work with foreign regulators and, and foreign sovereigns uh, to not only match work that they're doing, but have reciprocal rules so that we can create um, more global, more transparent, uh, and more efficient markets. So um, thanks again, especially to the staff for the for the uh, intending presentation in a little bit, but uh, of course, as always, for all their work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Stump. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you all. Um, and I also wish to commend the chairman and all of the commissioners for the work that's been done um, with regard to international coordination of global markets. They require globally coordinated regulations. And I think we have made strides in that regard over the past few years. Um, and, and in fact, over the past decade, there have been many people who have worked towards globally um, a global consensus on how we regulate the OTC market. But talking about Part 30 specifically, I do think there are many lessons that can be learned from the Part 30 regime and the way it's been applied in the futures market and the manner in which we as an agency have worked with our counterparts on the futures market and the future market regulator, regulators across the world. So thank you. With that, I have no statement. Thank you, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Berkovitz. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. And, and uh, thank all, all my colleagues on the commission as well as the staff uh, for their excellent work in bringing the rule, um, the final rule uh, before us today. Um, before us, um, uh, I'm pleased to be able to support uh, the rule today as well as the other uh, actions that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Chairman. The actions that we're taking today uh, on, on this rule, as well as the Part 30 uh, recognitions that, that you mentioned that we're announcing today, um, uh, as has been noted, are in furtherance of our statutory mandate um, to work towards international harmonization and the longstanding uh, Part 30 program, which I think over time has been a, been a success in, in, in permitting a U.S. Uh, person's access to foreign markets uh, to, to, manage, to manage risk and the furtherance of global harmonization and recognition of international comedy. So uh, I was pleased to support the Part 30 actions, and I look forward to uh, today's presentation. Uh, and I'm uh, pleased to support today's rule, both not only for international comedy, but uh, for uh, uh, pursuant to the mandate, uh, the congressional directive to um, uh, for exemptions for a smaller financial institution. So I look forward to the staff presentation and thank everybody uh, for, for the work uh, leading up to today. Thank you very much, Commissioner Berkovitz. We'll now move to our consideration of the final amendment to the Part 50 clearing requirement exemptions. After a short presentation, the floor will be open for questions and remarks from each commissioner. 
The final votes conducted in this public meeting will be recorded votes. The results of the votes approving the issuance of rulemaking documents will be included with those documents in the Federal Register. To facilitate the preparation of approved documents for publication in the Federal Register, I'd now ask the Commission to grant unanimous consent for staff to make the necessary technical corrections prior to submitting them to the Federal Register. So moved. Second. Thank you. Without objection, so ordered. Well, now I'd like to welcome Mark Hutchinson, Director of the Division of Clearing and Risk, who will present today's final rule. Clark, you have the floor. Thank you. And just a sound check, everyone can hear me all right? Loud and clear. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners and fellow staff. I am Clark Hutchison, the director of the Division of Clearing and Risk, and I am here to present final rules to amend Part 50 of the Commission's regulations related to certain exemptions from the Commission's swap clearing requirement. Before I present, I would like to recognize the following Division of Clearing and Risk staff who have worked diligently to prepare the final rulemaking. Megan Wallace, Melissa Darcy, and Sarah Josephson. In addition, I'd like to thank our colleagues in the Office of the General Counsel, Carlene Kim and Clark Ogilvy, and our colleagues in the Office of the Chief Economist, Scott Mixon and Isla Kaihan, for their assistance in preparing this rulemaking. The final rules before you would amend the regulations governing which swaps are exempt from the clearing requirement under Section 2H1 of the Commodity Exchange Act, or CEA. The new regulations would exempt swaps entered into by central banks, sovereign entities, international financial institutions, or IFIs, certain bank holding companies, savings and loan holding companies, and community development financial institutions, or CDFIs, from the swap clearing requirement, all consistent with policy determinations the Commission set forth in the 2012 end user exception rulemaking, as well as six DCR staff no action letters. In addition, these final rules will add a clearing requirement compliance date chart and make certain minor restructuring amendments to Part 50. This final rulemaking aligns with the Commission's core values of providing clarity and greater certainty to market participants that have been relying on Commission statements and staff no action letters with respect to the application of the swap clearing requirement. These amendments are consistent with the way the clearing requirement is being administered today and make Part 50 of the Commission's regulations easier to understand and apply. New Subpart D of Part 50 will consist of five new regulations that largely codify current market practice. These new rules are, number one, Regulation 50.75, which exempts from the clearing requirement swaps entered into by a central bank or swap sovereign entity. Number two, Regulation 50.76, which exempts from the clearing requirement swaps entered into by 22 named IFIs as well as any other entity that provides financing for national or regional development in which the U.S. government is a shareholder or contributing member. Number three, Regulation 50.77, which exempts from the clearing requirement certain interest rate swaps entered into by community development financial institutions. Number four, Regulation 50.78, which exempts from the clearing requirement swaps entered into by certain bank holding companies and finally, number five, Regulation 50.79, which exempts from the clearing requirements swaps entered into by certain savings and loan holding companies. The final rules before you today are largely unchanged from the original proposal. However, in response to comments the Commission received on the proposal, staff recommends making one important modification to the final regulations to clarify that the Exemptions from swaps entered into by central banks, sovereign entities, and IFIs are not dependent on the exempted swaps being reported to a swap data repository, or SDR. Under one reading of proposed regulations 50.75 and 50.76, the exemption would have been dependent on the swap being reported to an SDR by either the central bank, sovereign entity, or the IFI electing the exemption, or the counterparty to such an, an entity. A swap's counterparty failure to report 
would make those swaps ineligible for exemption, even if the central bank, sovereign entity, or IFI had no knowledge of their counterparty's failure to report appropriately. Because this reading of the proposal does not reflect the Commission's intent, staff is recommending that the final rule text remove the reference to reporting. This change will allow the current practice to continue regarding which counterparty reports the swap to an SDR and does not impose any new obligations on central banks, sovereign entities, or IFIs. It is important to note that the final rules do not relieve any swap counterparty's independent obligation to report the swap under Commission Regulations 45.3 and 45.4. Apart from this change, staff recommends that the Commission adopt the rules as proposed. Staff believes that the exemptions for swaps entered into by central banks, sovereign entities, and IFIs are a proper exercise of the Commission's discretionary authority under Section 4C of the CEA and are in keeping with the principles of international comedy and consistent with policy determinations the Commission made in 2012 in promulgating the end-user exception to the swap clearing requirement. Staff also believes that the exemptions for swaps entered into with certain bank holding companies, savings and loan holding companies, and CDFIs are a proper exercise of the Commission's discretionary authority under Section 4C of the CEA. Part 50 already provided for an exception from the clearing requirement for swaps entered into by small banks and savings and loans institutions with assets of less than $10 billion that use swaps to hedge or mitigate commercial risk. The new rules before the Commission today would permit swaps entered into by the holding companies of those entities to remain uncleared. Bank holding companies and savings and loan holding companies generally enter into interest rate swaps to hedge interest rate risk that they incur as a result of making loans or issuing debt securities, the proceeds of which are generally used to finance their subsidiaries. These enter entities enter into swap financing transactions infrequently and have relatively low volume swap books. Similarly, the new rules would exempt swaps entered into the CDFIs, recognizing that CDFIs share certain characteristics with the entities Congress identified when it directed the Commission to consider an exemption from the clearing requirement for small banks and savings associations. For example, under a U.S. Treasury Department program, CDFIs serve rural and urban low-income communities that lack adequate access to affordable financial products and services. CDFIs make loans and other investments for the benefit of designated investment areas and target populations. As part of this work, CDFIs enter into a very limited number of interest rate swaps and forward rate agreements in order to hedge their interest rate exposures. Lastly, the final rule creates a new subpart B with regulation 50.26, which is a compliance date chart for the Commission's swap clearing requirement. This chart identifies each category, class, and type of counterparty that is required to clear and the date on which the clearing requirement became effective. Although the Commission has publicized the dates of its clearing requirements in prior rulemakings and press releases, for the first time, this information will be available in one place for market participants to reference. As noted earlier, the final rule also contains other minor, non-substantive changes to Part 50 regulations, such as renumbering the exemptions for swaps entered into a small bank and savings association to clearly delineate the availability of the exemption. We hope this overview has been helpful and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman? Well, thank you very much, Clark, for that insightful presentation. And I also wanna thank uh, the staff that you mentioned uh, for their outstanding work in preparing this final rule for Commission consideration. To begin the Commission's discussion and consideration of the final rule, I'll now entertain a motion to adopt the final amendments to the Part 50 clearing requirement exemptions. So moved. Second. Thank you. I'd now like to open the floor for my fellow commissioners to ask any questions. Uh, I'll start, but I actually don't have any questions. Uh, I think I articulated the reasons why I fully support this final rule in my opening statement. And of course, I also support the technical clarification that you mentioned 
uh, Clark, that, that, that the, the small change that we made from the proposed rule to this final rule. So very pleased to support this and once again want to thank uh, Commission staff for their excellent work. Uh, Commissioner Quintet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks, Clark, for that great presentation. And again, I'd like to also follow you in recognizing uh, Megan, Melissa, Sarah, Carlene, uh, Clark, Scott, and, and Isla. Thank you uh, to all of them for their work on this. Um, I, I just have two quick questions, if I could, uh, Clark. Um, uh, you know, the discussion of, of what a sovereign entity is, you know, may seem straightforward uh, to some, but um, I think it's important to recognize that in this rule, that doesn't extend to state and local government financing entities, uh, including those abroad, um, which may not be permitted to be exempt from the swap clearing requirement. Could you discuss that for just a quick minute? Sure. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Quintens. Staff is recommending that the definition of entities that are exempt from the swap clearing requirement remain consistent with the status quo that's been around for several years, roughly about seven. The definition of swap, uh, excuse me, of, of sovereign entity under the Part 50 means a central government, including the U.S. government or an agency or department or a ministry. Expanding the definition of sovereign entity to include states and other instrumentalities, such as agencies, departments, or ministries, and the financing entities those entities may have in place, would go beyond the status quo that we've had in place for the past seven years. Additionally, this new approach would require the Commission to periodically reassess which entities are included with the definition of sovereign entity and financing entity, by the way, based on geopolitical events and whether um, a specific entity meets certain standards of state or foreign law. The staff believes that this isn't feasible under the present statute. And as explained in the adopting release, the final rule defines the term sovereign entity so that it excludes state governments. This definition reflects the fact that Section 2H7 of the CEA limits the exemption from the clearing requirements to national governments and uh, thereby excludes state, regional, or provincial, or even municipal governments. And this limitation applies equally to U.S. and non-U.S. entities. Um, I'd also like to note that the final rule reflects the fact that most government entities are predominantly engaged in non-financial activities related to their public functions and therefore are likely to be, are not likely to be actually financial entities subject to the CFTC's swap clearing requirements in the first place. As non-financial entities, these governments are eligible to elect an exception from the clearing requirement under present commission regulations. So I think that that really gets to the point of defining um, sovereign entities versus state and local entities, as you might have suggested, and I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Clark. Yes, it is. It's very, it's very helpful, I think, um, not only uh, statutorily, um, but also from a um, resource and process perspective, how confusing and complicated that can be on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, I, I would note um, my interest in that issue isn't necessarily domestic as opposed to abroad. Um, uh, but you know, the, the issues there may be few and often far between. But there could be other avenues to address those. But thank you for that. I, that was a very robust answer, which I appreciate. Um, last question, Clark, if I could. I think it's important to get a sense of um, the volume that we're talking about, uh, whether or not how, how, how large this activity is that we're thinking about exempting. Could, could you describe um, what your understanding is of the volume of, swap, of swaps that have, have been exempted from the clearing requirement under the existing release? Yes, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I have in some notes here some, some statistics, if you don't mind if I, if I read for a second. Um, during 2018, 16 IFIs elected not to clear their swaps under existing relief. Uh, this resulted in roughly 2,500 uncleared swaps, which had an aggregate notional value of approximately $220 billion. So that was in uh, 2018 for uh, 16 IFIs. In 2018, for uh, CDFIs, eight elected not to clear their swaps under this relief. This resulted in 13 and only 13 uncleared swaps having an aggregate notional value of 84 million. 
And then in 2018, 11 bank holding companies elected not to clear their swaps under this existing relief. This resulted in 18 uncleared swaps, which had an aggregate notional value of about $152 million. So you can see that uh, CDFIs and bank holding companies really um, don't re haven't taken advantage of this very often. And it, it's really um, IFIs that have used the bulk of it, but in total, not, not very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I think, you know, when I'm talking about millions of dollars in terms of swaps, uh, especially interest rate swaps like you would describe, I mean, I don't even think that qualifies as a drop in the bucket. I think even, you know, getting into the $200 billion range, while well, it sounds like a very large number, uh, and it could be from a risk perspective uh, in, in interest rate swaps, it, it does not represent a significant risk. Uh, and we're talking about a swaps market that has hundreds of trillions of dollars of uh, notional value. So. Um, thanks for that, putting it in context. Appreciate that, and thanks again for the hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Quintens. Commissioner Benham. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And, Clark, thank you for that um, excellent presentation, and I also want to extend thanks to uh, Megan, Melissa, and Sarah as well, and DCR, and also staff and OGC. I, I had a similar line of question um, than, than Commissioner Quintens did, and if you don't mind, I'm going to just follow up a little bit on that, Clark. Uh, I, I agree with what Commissioner Quinten said, um, just said in terms of the, the scope and the relative size of um, the exemptions and the data that you provided as it relates to the larger market. Clark, can you just confirm that you sort of agree with what Commissioner Quinten says, whether you know you want to use the drop in the bucket analogy or something <laughs> similar, just to, to just to tell the public that really this is. Uh, based on the data that DCR has collected and provided in the rule, um, a very, very small portion of the larger um, uh, interest rate market, specifically, uh, or CDS market. Yes, I can confirm um, without reservation, wholeheartedly, that uh, the notional value of these swaps is um, not material to the overall swap market. Um, I, I, will, I will assist Commissioner Quintens in his... Uh, description of it as a drop in the bucket. I think that's that's probably about right. <laughs> and uh, I think that this this proposed rule um, is, is doing what it's designed to do. Those, those entities that use swaps in, uh, I'll say, a, a non-material way um, can, it, can escape the burden that might otherwise have occurred um, should, should uh, we, we have required them to, to, to clear as, as, as others might. This is a very small number that, that we're giving uh, exemption to. Thanks, Clark. And I, I think just a follow up to that quickly, and I'll, I'll move on after this. But there's a nice line in the rule that I think is worth sort of uh, paraphrasing. But really, this exemption is not going to, and I use this word in quoting, dramatically shift the level of swap clearing pursuant to the clearing requirement. I think that's important to note um, to just sort of follow up and I think affirm what uh, what you just said. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the, the the sovereigns and and the IFIs a little bit. We we talked about the statutory exemption, but can you, from your perspective, um, give a little bit of a sense from a risk perspective why it's smart from a policy perspective to to exempt swaps that are uh, executed by these institutions? Well, I think that. Um a swap is a, as everyone knows, is a counterparty transaction, and the risk associated with a counterparty transaction is the the ability of that counterparty to perform. And I think that when we start talking about exempting people from swaps, uh, from clearing, we we have this uh, idea of performance. And I think that central governments, sovereign entities, um, and then also um, community development. Uh, banks and savings and loans that we described are entities that are using swaps uh, for a specific purpose with every intention to perform and have the credit rating and the ability to perform. So I think um, putting these uh, entities in a different category and, and giving them uh, an exemption makes sense from a performance point of view. And I just also think uh, from, from the point of view of, of what they're trying to accomplish uh, in, in, in the greater good of the, of the commercial um, marketplace. Thanks, Clark. That's that's excellent, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. That's a that's a great summary, I think, and a little bit of a um, an outline, I think, for the folks that are listening who might not um, 
um, understand or, or see the larger policy, um, both initiatives and, and reasonings for why we're doing what we're doing today. Um, so with that, I, I would just thank you again for your work. I think this is a good step in terms of um, the agency's effort, as we said at the beginning in the opening statements, to uh, improve our international harmonization. I think we do a lot to uh, harmonize our, our rules with our colleagues overseas, but we can always do better. And I think this is a step in the right direction. And also, um, I think it's important to note that we are in many respects codifying no action relief that has been around for a number of years. And this has been a challenge, uh, I think, for the agency, but more importantly for the market in terms of regulatory certainty. Uh, and I know this has been an initiative of a number of chairs uh, over the past few years is to knock out a lot of these no action relief letters uh, and uh, policies that have uh, existed and, and have been extended year over year and uh, have created uncertainty. And I think this creates a level of certainty that um, I think is a step in a very positive direction. So again, appreciate the work of DCR, uh, Clark, um, and your work as well. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I look forward to supporting uh, the rule later on this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Stump. Thank you, Chairman Tarbert. I, I don't have any questions. Um, as has been said, the folks who worked on this, um, it should never be interpreted by the lack of questions or the lack of controversy or the lack of applause that we have, um, ha that they haven't worked tremendously hard on getting us to where we are today. So I just wish to thank everyone. Um, this is fulfilling a statutory mandate and building upon the things we've done over the past 10 years to get us to this point. So I'm happy to support the role before us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Berkovitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and thank you, Clark, uh, for, for the presentation and um, the ensuing discussion. I, I just want to follow up on several of the questions that uh, my colleagues have asked, and maybe I can to tie, tie together a little bit some of the, the themes that um, the, the questions and answers have, have put before us. And, and if, if um, my characterization of this um, uh, needs supplementing or correcting, please feel free to do so. So as I see um, what we're doing here today, there's a number of factors, in addition to the legislative, but, but reasons that uh, compel the uh, the, uh, the result in this final rule, as well as provide us a comfort that by uh, providing uh, this exemption, we're not introducing uh, any significant new risk, any material risk into the system. Uh, the, the one factor that that we we've, we've talked about is is the size, the magnitude, the number of transactions involved, uh, and the notional value of those transactions being whatever uh, adjective you use, um, small. Um, uh, I'll just use the word small, relatively small compared to the big, big swaps world. Uh, the other is the nature of the counterparty. Uh, the nature of the counterparty here are, are sovereign, uh, so sovereign entities. Uh, and, I'm, and then I also see that the purpose of these swaps, and maybe I can ask you to uh, uh, elaborate on it. I think you talked about the nature of the counterparty being the sovereigns. We feel more comfortable about you know, that they're going to be there, the, the ECB or whatever, it's, it's the default risk on one of these swaps for the ECB is, is pretty small. But could you also talk about the nature of the transactions that they're going to be entering into, that, that we're, we're confident that, that these entities are not entering into speculative transactions, but also some of these are, uh, th these entities have more of a commercial um, uh, a purpose in terms of uh, encouraging commercial activity or providing funds for uh, uh, for economic growth, uh, and can you just expound on on when when we look at these, we look at not just the fact that it's sovereign, but what it's actually using these these swaps for? Sure. No, thank you, Commissioner Berkovitz. I, I think your point's a good one, and I think we do have to remember that um, one one of the purposes here, besides as you say, the element of uh, counterparty risk that we feel confident with the performance of these entities. It's, it's the financing that goes on for, I'll, I'll call it purposes of development and purposes of good. So if we go away from sovereign entities to savings and loans and their, um, their parent entities, as was discussed in the, in the, in the preamble that I gave, I, I would say that we want these entities 
or their entities, the, the transactions that they do are designed to help perhaps rural communities or specific targeted um, efforts to for community development um, or, in, in fact, um, outside the U.S. For, for development that the U.S. government feels is, is a, a, not only a good investment, but it also for development of, of, of purposes that, that are outside just speculation. And I think um, if we can call those uh, efforts of good, um, these, these transactions that are going on are, are financing transactions uh, that are for, and, and, and the swaps that are used for those financing transactions are for hedging risk, interest rate risk. So I think um, hedging is, is not speculation. Hedging is, is an activity to insulate uh, financing activity from risk. And I think this all hangs together very well, um, as I think you rightly concluded, which is we have good counterparty risk with these entities. We have a good social purpose for these entities. We have hedging as opposed to speculation being used in these uh, interest rate swaps. So I think they meet a lot of uh, requirements that, that are different than, I would say, uh, swaps that might be used for other means, and uh, which is, I think, the intent of, of why we're here today. So um, does that does that help? Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful. Thanks. That, 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 that's helpful. I, um, in terms of other requirements, you talked about reporting requirements. Uh, this, this does not relieve any um, transactions from being subject to the, the reporting requirements that the counterparty would have to report. Is that is that the case for these transactions? That it would be uh, that the counterparty to the sovereign would be required to report this to uh, our SDR, one of our SDRs. Well, yes. Um, I, I think what we're what we're doing here is. Um, we wanted to make sure that the re reporting requirements are not um, are not misunderstood in any way. I think that uh, what we wanted to make sure is is that if if a uh, an entity failed to report, somehow the exemption would be uh, not not given. So I think what we've done is we we've, we've said that the reporting requirements um, are. Are, are modified such that we won't have that 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 conundrum that we had before that might might come into the reading of the rule. But going forward, just as today, we we can we can be confident that looking back on the record of who's been subject to the no action relief and what's the the universe of swaps that um, are are, uh, are are being exempt are not being cleared due to this exemption. The, the the volume, uh, the number of transactions plus the notional amount, we have that data. We will continue to get that data going forward, so we'll be able to monitor this and uh, a year from now say, okay, are we at the same level of risk in terms of this exemption? Uh, yes. Correct? Yes. The SDR? No, sorry I didn't make that perhaps clearer in my previous response, but the answer to that is just simply yes. We've, we've been getting this data all along, and we will continue to get this data going forward. We just wanted to eliminate um, any particular reading of this rule that, that might confuse people as to reporting requirements and that sort of thing. But the answer to your question is yes. Okay. And then, then finally, in terms of counterparty risk, uh, are these transactions uh, still nonetheless subject to the um, uh, uh, uncleared uh, margin, margin rules so that potentially they, they would, even though they're exempted from the clearing requirement, they're, they're subject to margin requirements? Yes. So, 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 not only so, even for the reason, these robust counterparties, um, there, there's still margin requirements. So uh, that that um, um, that, that, yes. that provides a of confidence that, that, that there's not significant new risk coming into the system through this. That's correct. Okay. Well, well, th thank you. I, I, I think um, given given the. Uh, um, um, the, the factors that we've discussed, the, the, the scope of these, uh, uh, what we're talking about here in terms of the exemption, the nature of the counterparties, the purpose of the swaps, the uncleared margin requirements, are still, still reported to the SDR. I think there's a, uh, uh, and, and the beneficial purposes to uh, recognize these sovereign entities and, and, and international comedy. Uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, we, 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 this is a reasonable, reasonable approach to take, and uh, I feel com comfortable supporting uh, today's final rule. So thank, thank you, Clark, and thank you for the team, uh, for, for, the, uh, for, for the rule, for the responsiveness to the comments, and for the 
the presentation today. And Commissioner Berkovitz, thank you for helping summarize the rule um, again in, in, in terms that I think everyone will understand. I appreciate that and I agree with what you've just said. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner Berkovitz. And of course, thank you, Clark, for uh, answering our questions. Uh, I can ask all of the commissioners to go ahead and, and turn on their videos now. So I can ask whether there is any commissioner who is not prepared to vote. Okay, hearing none, I think we can go ahead and ask our secretary, Mr. Kirkpatrick, to please call the roll for the final amendments to the Part 50 Clearing the Requirement Exemption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The motion now before the commission is on the adoption of the amendments to the Part 50 Clearing Requirement Exemptions. Commissioner Berkovitz. Commissioner Berkovitz votes aye. Commissioner Berkovitz votes aye. Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Stump votes aye. Commissioner Stump votes aye. Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Benham votes aye. Commissioner Benham votes aye. Commissioner Quintens. Commissioner Quintens votes aye. Commissioner Quintens votes aye. Chairman Tarbert. Chairman Tarbert votes aye. Chairman Tarbert votes aye. Mr. Chairman, on this matter, the ayes have five, the noes have zero. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I'm pleased to say that the ayes have it, and the motion to adopt the final rule is hereby approved. Now I'd like to give my fellow commissioners an opportunity to make closing statements. Uh, and we'll start in reverse seniority order with Commissioner Berkovitz. Uh, no, nothing uh, formal. Um, I just again want to thank everybody uh, um, um, at DCR for, for their work on this rule. I thank my fellow commissioners and, of course, thank my staff as well. Thank you very much, Commissioner Berkovitz. Commissioner Stump. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to use my opportunity to make a closing statement to um, just note or highlight that the CFTC is unmatched when it comes to our staff's dedication and their commitment and their capabilities. And for two years, I've been the beneficiary of a CFTC trained chief of staff in Dan Buxa, who came to work with me from the Division of Market Oversight. And now that he's trained me in the ways of the CFTC, it's time for Dan's skill set to once again benefit the broader cause. So beginning next week, Dan will play a leadership role in our newly formed data division as the deputy director responsible for data reporting policy and standards across the agency. It's a bit bittersweet for me to see the creation of this new data division, which emphasizes our commitment to both data protection and the importance of the data that we collect. And I'm pleased to um, have Dan help lead the division. I, I know his skill set will benefit the new division, um, the chairman's um, leadership, and um, the new director, Dr. Tamara Roust. So I would, I would like to take just this very brief moment to um, thank Dan for his good humor about my obsession to the detail of things. Some might say that um, it's a, uh, I have a tendency to ask multiple questions about every single thing that enters absent objection, and Dan has handled it always with the, a great deal of confidence, but also with a great deal of, of, as I said, humor. And I think he's done a remarkable job. And I am particularly um, pleased that he shared my commitment to data protection and helped me work through those issues and, and played a leadership role in advancing that cause here at the agency. So Dan, I, I'm sure that the chairman and Dr. Rouse will be much more conversant than I was in historic military strategy, but if you ever care to revisit my ideas on Marie Kondo or the Great British Baking Show, I'm only a phone call away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Benham. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. No closing remarks, but uh, again, thanks to you and uh, DCR for uh, today's rule and I'm obviously happy to, to have supported it um, and as always just reiterating this is another I think um, fine uh, uh, action by the CFPC to, to demonstrate our our willingness and our success in working with our foreign counterparts um, also codifying no action which I said which I think is always a good thing for regulatory certainty but 
um, you know, remaining on our toes, uh, collecting data, using our, our tools and our personnel, our expert personnel to um, adjust and adapt as needed. We, we have flexibility to rewrite rules and, and do things as we need them and uh, adjust to market evolution. And I think uh, today's action is another step in positive uh, direction and demonstration of uh, the CFTC's willingness to act when, uh, when it's necessary. So thanks again to you and, and my fellow commissioners, and um, thanks everyone for, uh, for having a chance to listen this morning. Thanks. Thank you very much, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Quintanz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, first of all, thank you to all my colleagues for um, their consideration of the rule today and the discussion uh, that ensued. Uh, very educational, as always, and insightful questions. Um, I, I, I guess I can't help but notice, just given my passion for a few issues that have some relationship to this, is um, uh, at least I think there may have been a few that agreed with my assessment uh, on the, the relative size of hundreds of billions of dollars of swaps. And, um, you know, my insistence over a number of years that the de minimum threshold was not appropriately calibrated at $8 billion. Um, obviously, there are different policy considerations between the two, uh, but uh, that latter one is most specifically based on size. Uh, and if hundreds of billions of dollars are truly a drop in the bucket, maybe it's worth continuing to think about uh, whether or not the de minimum threshold is, is uh, appropriately sized for the market. And I would just encourage... Um, continued thought there uh, to, and um, a focus on data, uh, and I appreciated the discussion today. Um, let me join uh, Commissioner Stump in recognizing Dan Buxa. Uh, I've really enjoyed working with him. He's been wonderful in engaging with our staff. We've learned from him, and we, uh, we've had a wonderful line of communication. I wish Dan the best. And uh, I would also like to take a moment of personal privilege if I could uh, have everyone's indulgence that this will likely be the last open meeting that I have Kevin Webb on my staff serving as my chief of staff. Uh, Kevin has been with me since I was sworn in, and I still remember discussing details of with him uh, on my swearing in ceremony as we were on our way out to go fishing in a, uh, an effort to uh, get to know each other a little bit better over very shared common interest and passion. Uh, throughout our time here, he's, he's led our office with distinction, and he and I have had a lot of fun along the way through just intense work, immeasurable, immeasurable good spirits, uh, anticipatory uh, strategic thinking, effective internal communication and deliberation, and intense and highly productive uh, international and domestic travel. Uh, Kevin has proved himself to be the most trusted and valuable right-hand deputy I have ever had and likely will ever have, uh, but I am most fortunate to have considered uh, and getting to continue considering him a close personal friend. So I'd like to thank Kevin publicly for all his hard work for me, for my office, for the commission, for our markets, and for our country. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Commissioner Quintens. Uh, so in closing, I guess uh, I would just sort of echo a number of the things that were said by my fellow commissioners. First of all, pointing out how great our staff has been how much work they've done in ensuring that the CFTC is forward thinking and that we stay ahead of the curve. Um, I, I also want to commend uh, Commissioner Stump in particular for her data protection initiative, but all of the other commissioners for their input on how do we make the CFTC a more effective organization. Uh, so I was very excited to announce the, the reorganization of, of major aspects of our agency last week, including the creation of the Division of Data uh, for the first time. Uh, I am also pleased that Dan Boxo will be leaving Commissioner Stump's uh, employ to come and become a leader in that division uh, as Deputy Director. Uh, and I'm also very pleased that Kevin Webb and his many years of experience uh, will be translate to our Office of International Affairs, uh, where he can continue to strengthen uh, our, our work with our international counterparts. Uh, I feel as if I've, I've gotten to know uh, not only you know m much of the leadership uh, throughout the agency, but also those in the commissioner's offices, because we've done so much together uh, as a five-member commission. With these five, or the five of us in particular, this is our 19th open meeting together, uh, and people have seen the amount of work and output, and of course, all of this done during the greatest uh, health pandemic and economic challenge the country has faced in in decades. 
Uh, and so the CFTC is, is working hard on behalf of the American people, but ultimately it's the people within the CFTC that make this organization so great. So I'm obviously privileged to, to be the leader of the organization. Uh, so with that, I will uh, ask whether uh, there's any further business. Um, and if not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Adjourn the meeting. Uh, those in favor of the, I hear no, uh, in any, any further business? Okay, those in favor of adjourning the meeting will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Hey, the, the ayes have it. And again, I am so grateful for the CFTC staff for their great work, uh, as well as for my fellow commissioners and all the effort that they've put into this rulemaking and all the rulemakings we've conducted together. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a great day.